Hello and welcome to Religion and Life. I'm your host, Ozzy Ostwald. This program examines the role religion, spirituality, and philosophy play in everyday life. And my guest today, Dr. Aaron Simmons, makes it his life's work to help us understand how philosophy and religion are relevant in our lives. Thank you for joining us, Aaron. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate you, so you uh, coming up to the mountains. I know you enjoy being in this area. It does not take much to get me to the mountains. Yeah, um, we have a few philosophers from time to time, uh, but I don't think we've ever had a philosopher quite like you. Um, so I want to get at some of the things you do, but maybe you could start just by introducing yourself and oh, yeah. uh, how you came to, uh, I, I guess now you're, you're kind of uh, moving into philosophy for the masses in a, in a way, along with your academic work, but just yeah. give us a little brief um, summary of how you got to this point. Oh, happy to. Yeah. So I actually started going to college wanting to do physics, and there was a day in my physics class, I think it was my sophomore year, when I sort of looked at my physics professor and thought, I can't do pocket protectors and <laughs> uh, tape on the glasses for the rest of my life. Yeah. So I changed my major. Went to Europe, studied Gothic architecture and the humanities, came back and decided what I really like are ideas. And I ended up getting two degrees in history before realizing that I cared less about what people had thought and more about how what they had thought should inform how we should think. Hmm. And that was the switch to philosophy. Right. And so I got into philosophy not to be a spectator, but to be a player, to do this, to live this. And so philosophy for me was exceptionally interesting, especially relative to like existential philosophy, phenomenology, 19th and 20th century thinking, because these thinkers were deeply invested in philosophy, not only as a way of life, but philosophy as thinking well so that we can live well. And so that kind of, you know, launched my career. I've spent all of my career at liberal arts colleges, uh, mm -hmm. taught at Swanee, Hendricks College. Now I'm at uh, Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Love it. Made a little run into March Madness uh, a couple <laughs> weeks ago. Very right. excited about that. Yeah. And most of my work focuses on philosophy of religion in a broadly postmodern space. So how do we think about God and faith and religious identity in a time when that's not normally the way that we would make sense of ourselves philosophically. So right. I sometimes say it, how do we think about God after the death of God? What hmm. does that mean? Is, is, is that what you would call postmodern uh, philosophy or philosophy of religion maybe? And I don't know, maybe we need to distinguish between uh, philosophy and philosophy of religion, or do you make such a distinction? I do. Uh, I think philosophy of religion is doing philosophical work with a focus on cultural traditions and human practices that are traditionally called religion. Okay. And so part of the first question of philosophy of religion is, you know, what do we mean by religion? Mm -hmm. What is this cultural artifact or this cultural mode of living that is of particular interest? The philosophical work is simply saying, well, let's use the tool set of arguments of reason giving mm -hmm. to think very well about the claims that are made internal to different ways of living. Are these true? Are they false? Do they have good reasons for them? Are they justified? Are they well motivated? And that's effectively, I think, what philosophy more broadly is. It's a way of living committed to thinking well in light of the best reasons, right. the best evidence we have. Yeah. Postmodernism is, I think, actually a narrower space. It's a way of doing philosophy that reminds us about our essentially located and contextually identified lives. Mm -hmm. So to think well means to think as the body that I am in this cultural space, engaging in this linguistic set of practices. So it basically strips away the pretense right. that we could somehow step outside of our lives to talk about living. Yeah. Postmodernism is that reminder. Okay. Now, when you're doing your academic work, right, you're, you're writing about people like uh, Kierkegaard mm -hmm. and Derrida and Levinas and others, um, right. but that's not what you've been doing in addition to that, yeah. you've been, I, I, I don't want to say popularizing philosophy, but maybe making philosophy palatable for a larger audience. Yeah, so really when COVID hit, mm -hmm. something occurred to me. It was an interesting moment. So I started getting emails from students who were seniors graduating, you know, in two months. This was March 2020. And they were saying, I've dropped all of my other classes because I didn't need them to graduate. They were just, you know, filling space for my final mm -hmm. semester but I didn't drop philosophy. And of course that was perplexing to me, given that we are told in popular culture, philosophy is useless and a waste of time and it's never gonna make you any money. So I was like, well, why is this the class you kept? 
And I heard time and time again, because this is the only one that seems to speak to where we are. Mm -hmm. And where we were uh, was actually a place that reveals what the human condition is all about. Right. It's defined by vulnerability. It's defined by a kind of despair that threatens whatever joy we experience. And yet, it's also defined by joy that might shine through moments of anxiety and despair. Mm -hmm. And so, in that deep, globally countenanced awareness of our, our embodied vulnerability, I thought, man, I'm doing it wrong if <laughs> philosophy is only speaking to a bunch of PhDs. This is important work. Yeah. But there's a, a bigger space here that these ideas might actually resonate with. And so I started a YouTube channel, Philosophy Where We Find Ourselves, daily videos just trying to say, hey, I'm stuck at home, but we can still think together. Yeah. And maybe this is important. And so that pivoted some of my career over the last two, three years. So now I write about mountain biking and fly fishing and <laughs> hiking and my new book that I'm excited about is Camping with Kierkegaard. And so I'm trying hard to say, not that everybody needs to go do these things, right. but that we should all do whatever we think is worthy of our finitude. Mm. And too often we spend our lives doing the stuff that we then hope we can take a, vac a vacation from, <laughs> right? right? So we right. spend our lives, you know, 50 weeks a year, and then we get two weeks to do what we really love. My thought was, well, shoot. In light of millions of people dying and suffering in the trauma of this you know, global pandemic, maybe we can think more effectively about what it would look like to foster a society, to foster relationships and lives mm. that aren't just about leisure, but they're about purpose and meaning and doing things that then feed us such that we don't have to find a work-life balance. Right. What we do is we work because we live well, and working becomes a thing that is also part of what life involves, but it's not now something that we've got to you know, fundamentally wish were otherwise. Yeah. We can do this differently. I, I wanna come back to your YouTube channel in a moment, but I've got a couple of phrases here that you mentioned that I want to just throw back to you. Yeah. Um, you said that we, part of what philosophy helps us to do is learn how to live a life worthy of our finitude. I think that's important. Um, and really interested to, re interesting to find that your students found something in philosophy that helped them deal with the crisis at hand, which was the, the pandemic. And that's really what led you in this kind of new direction. Yeah. Uh, but it seems to me as I hear you talk that when you talk about living a life well, even thinking well, mm -hmm. um, and living a life worthy of our finitude, helping us to find um, purpose and meaning in our work and in all aspects of our life. It sounds like that this in some ways is the way religion can function, uh, maybe should function or fails to function in some ways, but mm -hmm. giving life purpose and meaning. Is this where you find the overlap in part between? Yeah, I think religion is one way mm -hmm. in which these big questions of human existence can find certain types of answers with certain types of direction. So one of the ways that I think about how we should navigate what's worthy of our finitude mm -hmm. is my suggest is we've got to fundamentally rethink a logic of success, which kind of defines our normal, you know, be successful, push really hard, eventually you'll retire, right? <laughs> and it's about checking boxes. It's about being accomplished in certain ways so that we deserve something like what's worthy of our finitude. Right. And I wanna flip that and say, no, instead of thinking about success as you know, accomplishments and checking boxes, let's think about faithfulness as living in a particular way such that the things that matter to us continue to define our activity, our beliefs, and our relationships. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I define faith as risk with direction. Okay. So we all are risking our lives, hence the vulnerability, but right. we're also vulnerable in some particular direction, and that directionality might be religion, it also could be different types of human endeavors, right? This could be the way that we understand ourselves as parents. Mm. It could be as uh, citizens, right? There's lots of different ways to think this direction is where the risk of doing it wrong, <laughs> regretting things, making mistakes, it's okay because I'm doing this faithful to what I think matters. Mm. And this is not something we're gonna check off the box of. 
So what does it mean to be a good father? I have a 13-year-old son. You know, I could be like George Costanza. And, you know, when everybody starts laughing, you throw up my hands and say, thank you and good night. Right. On a Tuesday, when I nailed being a good dad that day, walk away from my family and say, well, no, I accomplished it. Mm. But, of course, that's not being a good father. It's being faithful to every single day, getting up and continuing to be a better father. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true about citizenship, about being, you know, a, a lover relative to our partners and our friends. What does it mean to be invested in religion? That can be one other mode in which this risk with direction can play out relative to what we understand as the divine. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, I do identify as a Christian. I'm a Pentecostal. Um, that is a directionality that I definitely think worthy of the risk. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, in popular culture, I tend to think that a lot of um, certain manifestations of religious identity are very success-minded. And that's where I might say the, the majority of my critique begins, <laughs> is that it's missed the whole point of faithful existence and turned it into a checking the boxes of accomplishing certain sorts of tasks rather than living that way on purpose. It reminds me of when I was a kid, we had little envelopes that we had for Sunday school and we had to check off the tasks that we completed that week, <laughs> reading yeah. the Bible, giving our tithe and all these other things. That's, right. that's, that's success driven uh, well, Christianity, it, it, right? Kierkegaard says mm -hmm. that the whole task is to become a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he means become, not in the sense of so that one day it will be accomplished, he means that at every instant, we are becoming more and more like what it is that Christianity would call from us. Right. And I actually want to then say, as a philosopher, well, Sartre's also right when he says that we should try to become an atheist. Mm -hmm. That wherever we locate that directional risk, we should do it with all we've got, and we should be invested in why it matters. And that's not something that I think is unique to religion, but I think what we typically call religion are practices and commitments and communities that are invested in the idea that there is some degree of value with a vertical relation. A horizontal um, relation is infused by the transcendence of something more. Mm -hmm. And that something more we might name God. And I think in naming it God for people who do that, that can be something that humbles us to remember it's not about me accomplishing this or that. It's not about my ego. Right. It's about being open to and excited about relating to others and inviting them also to flourish. You almost sound like a transcendentalist as I listen <laughs> to you talk, but I, I don't know if we want to go there or not. <laughs> but if you're defining uh, faith as risk with direction, yeah. um, and you talk about faithfulness, what is it that we are to be faithful? faithful to? Is it to ourselves, to our own fulfillment as, as human potentials, or is that where we're yeah. headed with this? It's a good question. Yeah. So one of the things that philosophy students find very frustrating is that philosophy is better at questions that it, than it is at answers. Mm -hmm. And I once had a student, in fact, uh, get very mad at me. You know, where I teach is not a cheap school, it's a very expensive school. <laughs> and uh, this student wrote, <laughs> wrote on her student evaluations at the end of the semester, she said, um, class was okay, but I can't believe I paid this much money to have a professor who didn't know the answers to his questions. <laughs> and I was like, man, I, I, I blew it with that, mm. that student because yeah. the whole goal is in Camping with Kierkegaard and existential philosophy, the work that I do, and philosophy of religion, thinking about how do we make sense of these terms like God. All of this is not suggesting, well, here's then the answer book for someone else. It's instead, here's what it looks like to stand where I stand on purpose with what I take to be the best reasons available. Mm -hmm. And that is then an invitation to others to say, so where will you stand? Right. <laughs> what, what is it that you will find worthy of the narrative of your own life? Mm. And so, yes, I disagree with people about different types of things. So, you know, when I'm talking to my atheist friends, we disagree about the nature of the divine, whether even that is a nature worth talking about. When I talk to uh, consequentialists, I might disagree and say, look, I really think ethics is more about virtue and character development than it is about just, you know, outcomes and, right. and this kind of, again, that success logic of what results. But that disagreement is not a suggestion that they are somehow the obstacle to human flourishing. 
I would say if they are invested in those debates with honesty, humility, and then hospitality to objections, that they're modeling what it looks like to do this social thing well. Oh. And so my answer is not, here's the direction. <laughs> what I try to do is say, here are some of my directions. Hence mountain biking, <laughs> right? Hence talking honestly about God. Mm -hmm. So I'm very public about my religious commitments, not because I'm trying to convince others to be religious in the way that I am, but because I think there's something important about why I continue to stand here. Mm -hmm. But I want people to stand where they think matters and then do so with integrity and the humility that recognizes we could be wrong. And so let's keep talking. Let's, let's keep thinking about this. So earlier you identified as Pentecostal Christian. Mm -hmm. um, I might want to come back to ask you about what it means to be a Christian philosopher, and yeah. is that different from, from being a philosopher of religion? But um, so you grew up in Cleveland, Tennessee, so I'm guessing Church of God. Church of God, Cleveland. Yeah. I'm, I'm fourth generation Pentecostal. Really? Uh, so when I when I think of Church of God or the Pentecostal tradition, I think of a very experiential uh, kind of faith, um, and it, it, I, I'm just wondering how in your life you reconcile the experiential component mm -hmm. of your spirituality with the rational component yeah. of your academic life. Did yeah. they ever come together like this, or yeah. do you find a way to, to pull these things together? Yeah, well, I mean, so the kind of philosophy that I do is mm -hmm. often referred to as phenomenology. And mm -hmm. phenomenology is fundamentally about philosophizing well right. about the world as experienced. Yeah. Uh, and so I will say probably some of my Pentecostal upbringing and my continued Pentecostal identity is connected to maybe my uh, aptitude or taste for that kind of philosophizing. Mm -hmm. um, so I find interesting but less compelling the you know very hard-edged sort of logic chopping you know possible world semantics and debates about philosophy of language. I love reading that stuff, but it's not where I've spent my life contributing. Right. And the reason is I'm just more interested in asking questions that illuminate what most of us take for granted. Mm. And so I even define philosophers that way. Philosophers put question marks where everybody else puts periods. Yeah, I heard you say that in a TED talk. I, that's I, a great definition. It, it, <laughs> it's, it's stuck. I kind of said yeah. it one day in class, and I thought, that's right. That's, yeah. that's what I mean. This is why being a philosopher isn't about just having a PhD in philosophy. That's, that's a mode of doing this for a living. Mm -hmm. But I would say the mechanic, the donut shop owner, the person working at the local bike shop, all of these things are manifestations of ways of being philosophical. Right. If they are done on purpose, done with reflection, and we say, hey, is there a better way to do this? I think innovation is often driven by philosophical awareness. Mm -hmm. But Pentecostalism, the way I would describe it, is less experiential and more affect. So Pentecostalism is a very affective conception of religious life, okay. where affect means um, we are moved by, mm -hmm. <laughs> that there is a, not just emotional, but certainly that too, some mode of embodied investment, attachment to what it is that's going on. So it's more than um, a simple assertion that P and Q are true. It's about what does it mean to be moved by the truth of P? <laughs> right. how, how would that play out in my life? And so it's sometimes I'll, I'll describe this to people by saying, uh, <laughs> I've been married to my wife for 22 years. And if I were to say, well, you know, what does it mean to love my wife? I could give a bunch of propositional assertions. But it also, you know, I could say, well, there's a bunch of propositional assertions and here's how it plays out. But I also could say, look, it's living daily in relation to her. Right. And that's the thing that I think Pentecostalism gets right about religious life in a way that resonates with the way I do philosophy. Let's do it as a lived practice. Yeah. Well, it, it incorporates your definition of faithfulness, which is... Um, or, or faith, r risk with direction, that, that makes faith more of a verb than, than a noun. So it's right. not something that you accomplish or you acquire or you have. It's something you're doing. Well, and the same is true with life. Right. right. We tend to talk about life as this noun, which is a success way of approaching it. Right. Or we can think of it as living. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a movement. It's a way of being invested. 
And so the thought is not that I'm going to recommend to people what they should do. You know, they don't have to go to the mountains. My wife would much rather go to the beach. <laughs> you know, right. it's, so it's not about this is the way. It's about, well, are you actually willing yourself in this space on purpose? Yeah. And then we can start thinking about how that opens the question of social justice. Well, mm -hmm. have we created social structures that prohibit enormous groups of people right, primarily historically marginalized folks that now aren't able to actualize that agency relative to their finitude. Yeah. Well, maybe that calls upon all of us, I would say, as a religious and social task to rethink how we do our lives together. And so they all start opening onto each other. So it's not just here's existentialism detached from religious life, detached from social justice. Mm -hmm. These are all different sides of the same dynamic, you know, uh, attempt to live on purpose and live yeah. well. Well, you, you're getting your message out in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. You're, you're writing, still writing academic work. I don't know when you sleep. You've got several <laughs> books and hundreds of articles. Um, you're, you're working on this Camping with Kierkegaard book. Yep. Um, you, you, you've done uh, TED Talks. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, bring up a short trailer here that talks about your YouTube channel and we'll just take a, a quick look at it here if we can Sounds great. get this on the screen. Awesome. Hey everybody, I'm Aaron Simmons. This is Philosophy for Where We Find Ourselves, a YouTube channel devoted to thinking well in order to live well. Often, philosophy can seem intimidating, abstract, entirely too complicated. But on this channel, we take philosophical ideas proposed by some of the greatest thinkers in history and bring them into traction with our real lives, putting them on the ground, making them matter, and figuring out how to then apply this so that we can do things worthy of our finitude. Now, in order to pull this off, we have got to think together. I need your help. Drop comments. Tell me what videos you want me to make, what ideas you want to think about together. And in the meantime, check out my website, jarensimmons.com, where there's a lot of other resources and access to exclusive content. Thanks for joining with me. Let's walk together and talk along the way. That's really great. This is not my father's philosophy, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. I, I sort of expect you to turn your cap around and run off on a skateboard or something. <laughs> well, we, we're that filmed, actually, the video productions team that was with me. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all mountain bikers as well. And so we actually uh, filmed it and then put the video cameras back in the truck and hopped on the mountain bike trails. And, and you're off uh, and going. We're off and going, yeah. And I, I think I called your website J. Aaron Simmons. J. Aaron Simmons dot com. Uh, yeah, and there I do lots of content that's unavailable elsewhere, so all of my public audience work. Um, it's got links, of course, back to the YouTube channel, but also any podcasts I've done, any recent articles that I've published that I think are of interest to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. it, it allows for that sort of work. And it also, people can sign up for a monthly newsletter. So I send a newsletter every month that's inviting them in more long-form ways to think about philosophical ideas. This past month was about the relation of philosophy to theology. Mm -hmm. And the month mm -hmm. before that was trying to think about how this uh, green screen uh, you know, behind us making <laughs> videos yeah. can actually be a metaphor for how we navigate our world. Mm -hmm. and what is it we want to see as the context for our thinking? Maybe we can put that into practice. And right. so it's a, it's a really cool way, I think, of, of thinking with people that I would never meet in other ways. And I've been honored to do it. It sounds like no matter what you're doing, you're thinking in this way. You're thinking philosophy. You're thinking spirituality. And That's right. I, I know um, on your on your channel or on your website, I saw at one point you mentioned the spirituality of mountain biking, and yeah. you've mentioned uh, what is spiritual about mountain biking? How yeah. do you or or maybe drumming? I know you're a drummer, yeah. a musician. Um, yeah. So you find spirituality there too. How, Absolutely. How do you how do you find spirituality in these sort of everyday tasks? Yeah. And, and how would you lead others um, into it. <laughs> to, to, to be spiritual in that way of putting ourselves into the world? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, drumming is a maybe more obvious answer simply because I got into playing drums in church. Mm -hmm. And when I was playing drums in church from a very young age, I experienced what I would describe as the presence of God and the religious community from the drum set. Mm -hmm. And so again, think about being moved by an affect well, I'm the one controlling the bass thumps and where the snare hits. And so the idea of embodied engagement 
in religious practice was for me first and foremost through music. Hmm. Mountain biking, I actually think, is a type of liturgy. So it's a type of religious practice for me. It doesn't have to be religious for others. It can still be secularly liturgical because it's a practice that connects us to the most basic truths of human life. Hmm. <laughs> Our bodies break, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? Ro rocks and, and trees are trying to kill you when you're going really fast on mountain bikes and you're trying to jump over them. Um, but it also helps us understand that though our bodies break, the possibility of transcendence, of glory shining through these moments that otherwise can be just all too mundane. Hmm. The way I sometimes talk about this is, though the mountain will always win, <laughs> right? The, the, for the surfer, the wave is always going to be stronger than you. Right. What's so amazing to me, and for me this is a religious claim, though it doesn't have to be for others, though the mountain's gonna win, Though the wave is stronger than you, we get to ride mountains. Mm. That waves, we get to literally walk on water. That fact is for me the metaphor for everything that I take to be true about spiritual existence. Mm. Whether that gets cashed out in traditional religious senses, as it does for me, or as that gets cashed out in existential philosophical ways, right? It's a sort of awareness of something bigger than you that makes what you do really powerful. Yeah. Kierkegaard refers to it as the sublime in the pedestrian. Right. And that idea, I know of nothing better than getting ready to drop in on a mountain bike trail out in Pisgah National Forest <laughs> and realizing, man, th th this could so easily just be seen as more woods mm -hmm. to so many people. And yet for me, that line through this, over that rock, around that tree, this becomes a way of seeing the world differently. Right. And I think that is something all of us can learn to do. And that's, uh, I think, a helpful way to live. You really have to have a kind of heightened awareness when you're doing something like mountain biking down a cliff, I would think, or you will break. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I, it, words like wonder and awe come to mind when I think about that sort of focus, the tension. Is that, are those words that resonate with you? Oh my goodness, of, yes. yeah. I, One of my biking partners is actually an Anglican pastor. And uh, he and I bike together about once a week. And whenever we're biking, what's always fantastic is we are encouraging each other almost the whole time not to miss yeah. how amazing it is that we are doing this. Right. Yeah. And we're also in our mid 40s. So there's also a kind of look like we may not be able to do this in 10 years. We hope we are. But this sort of awareness, not just the trivial idea of enjoy the present, no. but of making the present part of the expectation of what we can't predict, right? And also the fulfillment of what it is that then is the story that we've already told. Mm. Th that relation is for me every bit part of how I navigate being a Pentecostal Christian. It's also how I navigate being a postmodern philosopher. And it's also how I then try to live, whether it's being a father, a son, a professor, a citizen, or a fishing mountain biker, right? Like whatever it is we do, um, how can I do this in a way that invites others to find that same activity in their life that allows purpose to be present, allows them to find a, a real reason to get out of bed? Yeah. Well, I, I applaud your work. I mean, I think it's important work, and I, I, I hope you find a very large audience. And I, I would just, uh, as, speaking as a 64-year-old, I would, I would remind you to keep thinking about how long you can <laughs> ride those Mikey biking trails. I, but, I, uh, I don't know. The e-bikes keep getting better <laughs> and better, true. so, you know. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed this discussion. Um, I appreciate you coming today. I um, hope you enjoy your time in the mountains before you have to go back down to uh, to Furman. Thank you so much. Pick it's been up. an honor to be here. We, my family's with me and we've been to the local lion eating donuts and oh, we yeah. went over to Appalachia Cookie Company and we've been to Magic uh, Bikes and checked out all their gear and of course have you know, visited the both mast locations. And so it's, <laughs> it's been a, a wonderful time here and uh, you know tomorrow we're going to get out and do some hiking and so oh, great. couldn't ask for a better week. Well if you need any recommendations let me know. I will do it. Thank, well, thank you, so you much. Thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Well, that's it for this week on Religion and Life. I thank my guest, Aaron Simmons, and thank you for joining us. I hope you'll join us next week on App TV when I talk to a group of Lutherans who went to Germany over spring break and followed the trail of Martin Luther, that great Christian reformer. Until then, this is Ozzy Ostwald. Nothing